Hello and welcome to part one of topic seven for science 30, the physics unit. Um, this, we will be discussing the history of the universe. How did the universe evolve? There are two theories about the evolution of the universe. The first is the steady state theory, where the universe is expanding at a steady state and galaxies are moving away from each other. The universe has no edge. The Big Bang Theory, which is popularized by the television show with the same name, um, says that the universe began with a giant explosion and expands at different rates. So here we have a picture of a bunch of scientists trying to describe the size of the Big Bang. The universe is in a constant state of change, and this um, illustrates the two theories. The first one, or A, is the steady state theory, where the amount of matter remains the same. So you have the same amount of matter on the inside of the circle as you have on the outside. In and out, in and out, so there's not much difference. So it's always a steady state of matter. The second um, is the Big Bang Theory, where you have highly dense, um, dense composition of matter in the middle, and that explodes outwards and radiates particles outwards, causing a gradual diffusion of matter from the inside of the Big Bang to the outside. According to the <coughs> steady state theory, the universe is expanding at a constant rate. According to the Big Bang Theory, the universe began with a giant explosion. So here, in the Big Bang model, you have a high density of material in the original orientation, and as the universe expands, the density becomes smaller. In the steady state model, as the university universe expands, the density of matter in the universe remains the same, so the space is filled by the formation of new galaxies. The Sun is the closest star to the Earth. <clears throat> How do stars, instead of stars, it should be stars, form? The first is a nebula, which is a huge cloud of hydrogen gas and dust. Gas begins to collapse due to the gravity. It contracts and heats up. When the core temperature becomes 10 million degrees Celsius, nuclear fission begins and electrons become stripped from atoms. Electromagnetic radiation and energy is produced. Stars shine because of nuclear fission, so you're having um, molecules are coming together. So here we have the Eagle Nebula and the Omega Nebula. Nebula are um, sort of the uh, cradles or the birthplace of stars. Nuclear fission is a process in which two small nuclei join together to form a larger nucleus, releasing energy. So we have hydrogen coming together to form helium. Proton-proton chain reactions occur between the hydrogen nuclei. An enormous amount of energy is released in gamma radiation and in kinetic energy. It occurs mostly in young stars. In the Sun, we have two hydrogen atoms come together to form a helium atom and this neutron. This produces electromagnetic radiation and makes stars shine. The temperature of stars. Stars appear to be different colors when looked at with the unaided eye and this is because of their temperature. The hottest stars somewhere between <clears throat> 112,000 to 97,000 degrees Celsius have their peak in the ultraviolet radiation so our eyes see these stars as white or bluish white. Our sun appears yellow because it is cooler, it's about 5,500 degrees Celsius. Even cooler stars appear to be red in the night sky, so that is about uh, 2,900 degrees Celsius. 
All stars begin in regions that are rich in hydrogen and dust, but stars don't shine forever. They have a, a lifespan. Their life cycle depends on the original mass of the star. Hydrogen eventually runs out and um, fusion reactions eventually stop. Stars are classified as low mass, like our sun, intermediate mass, or as high mass. Reactions occur more rapidly with a high mass or a large mass star. In a star, gravitational forces push inward, um, push material inward, and this is balanced by the pressure from fusion, which forces material out. When these forces become unbalanced, a star can collapse, either implode or explode. So here at birth, you can see uh, a lot of force, gravitational force pulling in and um, a large amount of fusion force pushing out. Here you have more fusion force than gravitational force in during middle age. And in uh, old age, what you have is you have a lot of gravitational force pulling in and not as much fusion pulling out. So the, what is the evolution of our sun? Our sun is a low mass star. Low mass stars spend their main uh, sequence lies fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores. A low mass star is one that has a mass that is not more than 1 times 10 or 1.4 times the mass of the sun, so our sun. A sun starts out as gas or dust and it eventually forms this low mass star. Um, our sun will expand and become a red giant and as that fusion fuel starts to run out it will become an expanding shell of gas and eventually um, collapse into a white dwarf. So, nebula, low mass star, red giant, white dwarf, black dwarf. What is a red giant? A red giant occurs when the core or helium fusion stops and hydrogen fusion occurs in the outer layer. The core will heat up and can tracks compressing the hydrogen from above and increasing the rate of fusion. So in a red giant you have an increased rate of fusion. The star becomes a thousand to ten thousand times brighter and expands. So it, it expands and it um, it's cooler but the rate of fusion heats up which is why it's called a red giant. The temperature of the star decreases. The actual color of the star is orange. In a white dwarf, the outer layers of the red giant are shed as planetary nebula, so those go off and eventually become the birthplace of new stars. A white dwarf is a star with a core but no fuel for fusion, fusion to continue, so you no longer have fusion. Its mass is comparable in size to the sun, but its size is comparable to the earth, so it's very small. There is a faint light that comes from stored heat, but there is no energy source. Eventually the heat will disappear and the result will be a black dwarf. None are known to exist in our universe right now. So what is the evolution of high and intermediate mass stars? In intermediate mass stars you have a collection of gas and dust that become an intermediate mass star. Um, as this fuel is consumed, it becomes a supergiant, then a supernova, then a neutron star. In a high mass star, you have a larger ball of gas and dust that form together to create a high mass star. When the fuel starts to run out, it becomes a supergiant, the star collapses, and then it becomes a black hole. Intermediate mass stars have a mass between 1.4 and 8 times the mass of our sun. High mass stars have a mass greater than 8 times the mass of our sun. Supergiant stars are part of the evolution of an intermediate 
and high mass star. It has a core temperature of approximately 3 trillion degrees Celsius. It occurs when hydrogen fuel is used up in the core of the star. A supernova is a stellar explosion that produces a very bright cloud of ionized gas that remains a very bright object in the sky for weeks or months. It can radiate as much energy as the sun can during its entire lifespan. The results from the gravitational force within the star are compacting at the core. A neutron star is a super dense star consisting of mainly of neutrons formed as the last stage of the stellar evolution of intermediate mass stars. It spins rapidly emitting radio waves. A single spoonful of a neutron star would weigh approximately 907,000 tons, so it's very dense. A pulsar is a neutron star spinning rapidly on its axis, emitting radio waves and pulses. This radiation can only be detective, it, detected if it is pointed towards the Earth, so it's sort of like a lighthouse. A pulsar in the Crab Nebula is thought to be the remains of a supernova explosion that was visible in Earth in 1045 AD, so over a thousand years ago. Black holes are an area in space with a gravitational field that is so strong neither matter nor electromagnetic radiation can escape it. It is the last stage of evolution of a high mass star. It consumes surrounding matter as the matter is pulled into the gravitational field. It is found by watching the effect on the matter outside of the black hole. A gas forms a disk around black holes. It heats up and gives off x-rays while accelerating into the hole. Telescopes were originally refined by Galileo in the 1600s and used to look at remote objects in the sky and collect electromagnetic radiation from space. Electromagnetic radiation can help us determine the composition and temperature of stars. Refracting telescopes are telescopes in which light from an object is gathered and focused by lenses with the resulting image magnified by the eyepiece. So you have an objective lens and an eyepiece like a microscope. A larger opening um, gives better resolution because there's less diffraction but it is difficult to make. This is a simple telescope. A reflecting telescope is another type of telescope. A telescope um, in which the light from an object is gathered and focused by a concave mirror at the back of the telescope. And um, it is reflected off a flat mirror into an eyepiece where it's magnified. Large reflecting telescopes are in Canada, France, and Hawaii. Or the Canada, France, and Hawaii telescope is one of the largest uh, reflecting telescopes with a mirror of 3.6 meters in diameter. It's used to observe infrared radiation emitted from objects in space. It works the same way as a small refracting telescope where you have a concave mirror um, where you have light coming in being focused by this concave mirror um, reflecting off this flat mirror into a viewing station. The Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope collects ultraviolet, infrared, and visible light emitted from planets, comets, and stars. It's another reflecting telescope. Here's a picture of its mirror. The telescope was launched high into the sky so that Earth's atmosphere does not observe, absorb any of the electromagnetic radiation that um, that the telescope's trying to collect. 